This is lecture 19 of PDEs. During today's lecture, we'll be looking at the Fourier transform as well as its relation to the delta function. And then we'll be applying these things to find solutions to the Green's function, or sorry, solutions to the wave equation using a Green's function during the second part of the lecture. A Fourier transform is a linear transform of the information content of a function into the frequency domain. It is defined or sort of denoted to be a different function, usually with a hat on, of a different variable k, which is an indication of um, the frequency space. And so to go to calculate the Fourier transform of f of x, we do it by means of an integral, a complex integral in fact. What we basically do is we say we take the integral from along the real line from um, minus infinity to infinity f of x times e to the minus i k x dx and divide or normalize by 2 pi. And this transform has several properties, one of which is basically, as I've said, to give you an idea of a, the frequency content. So generally, a localized function has a wide distribution of frequencies, high frequencies, whereas a more slowly varying function has, is constructed out of sort of lower frequencies and has a more compact support. To illustrate some of the ideas of the Fourier transform of a function, I'm going to compute the Fourier trans function, transform of a group of functions, um, namely the Gaussian curves that were introduced in lecture 16 explicitly. So all we do is we use the definition, so the Fourier transform of the Gaussian curve A as a function of K is simply 1 over 2 pi, this integral, where I have substituted the definition of delta A of X, namely a Gaussian um, with a certain uh, standard deviation into, into the integral. And what I'm going to do now is I'm simply going to make explicit the steps in calculating the closed form expression of this integral. So the first thing I do is I combine these two terms in the, um, in the exponent into one term by completing the square. So here is um, x over a squared. And this is the second term, which I've just rewritten in the form of um, a over x multiplying applied by another term. And this permits me to then add an additional term so that this full thing in the square brackets is a complete square. But I also have to then, um, basically I have a minus sign here, so I have to add that term back so that this integral is exactly inter equal, to the, equal to the original integral. And when I do that, I can then collect the terms and Here's our complete square over here. Um, and I'm going to simply introduce a new variable, which is this function in square brackets, and rewrite the integral in terms of that variable. So introducing y is equals to um, x over a plus i k a, uh, and then knowing that uh, dy is simply equals to uh, dx over a, in other words, dx is then equals to a dy, so I've cancelled out that a to get to this point. And then I've also had to change the boundaries of our integration, which is minus infinity plus i k a, so to, sorry, infinity plus i k a to minus infinity plus i k a. So I'm now uh, integrating along a line of constant imaginary part equals to i k a. And if you recall your... Um, complex integrals, you can simply rewrite this integral using a square box where the or square rectangle where the one the lower part of the rectangle is on the real line, the upper part of the rectangle is on um, the line y or the imaginary part is equals to i k a. And by letting the boundaries go to infinity, you can show that this integral is in fact simply equal to the integral um, from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus y squared. And this particular integral we worked out in lecture 16. And this is just equals to the square root of pi. Okay, so the square root of pi cancels that. 
square root of pi below the line out, and we're left with this result. So the Fourier transform of a Gaussian curve delta A is once again a curve that is Gaussian, um, but the normalization is slightly different, and whereas A entered in the denominator over here, it is of the exponent of the, uh, of, sorry, of the argument of the exponent, it is entering in the numerator over here. So uh, Gaussian curves are possibly the unique function where the Fourier transform is itself, um, possibly rescaled. And uh, an important thing to note, it will become very useful later on, is suppose now we take the limit as A goes to zero. Okay, Recall when we had the limit as A goes to zero, our Gaussian curve approached the delta distribution. And if you look at the, in other words, it was an infinitely high spike. And if you look at the Fourier transform of that distribution over here, if A goes to zero, the numerator goes to zero, so this goes to one. So this whole value goes to one over two pi. Okay, so that basically gives you the fact that as um, your uh, series of Gaussians approaches a delta function, so the Fourier transforms approaches a flat, a flat line with height 1 over 2 pi. So it just reiterates what I said earlier about, generally speaking, a feel is the more compact this function is, the more distributed the Fourier transform is, and this is an extreme case. For an infinitely compact function, you have an infinitely distributed Fourier transform. Just another thing to observe that's useful later on is that the Fourier transform of a function x minus y, if we substitute this into that expression over here, you simply have the delta function of x minus y times e to the i minus i k x, and the, the Fourier transform therefore simply becomes uh, this exponent evaluated at y. So it is e to the minus i k y over 2 pi. What I now want to do is explore what we call the inverse Fourier transform. And the method I'm going to do that is I'm simply actually going to derive it directly um, rather than just give you the definition. And the way we derive it is once again, let's start with a Gaussian curve. Suppose we have the Fourier transform of a Gaussian curve. In other words, there's delta hat AK defined by that expression. And we multiply it with the e to the IKY dx and we work out that integral. And we're going to use techniques exactly as what we did to work out this, the Fourier transform of the Gaussian curve. So we write it out and we try and write it in such a way that we complete the square in K. Okay, and there we go. In order to complete the square, we have to once again subtract over here what we've added. So this integral is equal to the above one. And using the same argument we used as by integrating in the complex plane over a rectangle, we can once again show that this integral is simply the square root of pi um, and multiplied by a as we change the, the sort of um, the variable and we're left with this result. Okay, so multiplying our Fourier transform of our Gaussian with e to the iky taking the integral gives us back exactly our original Gaussian curve. Okay, so this starts to give us the, an indication that possibly this recipe will give us uh, uh, inverse transform of the Fourier transform. Okay, and there I've just written it out. And in fact, another useful identity is if you take the limit as a goes to zero, okay, this becomes a delta function over here, and your uh, transform here becomes a constant, you're left with a result that you can express your delta function of y as 1 over 2 pi times the integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the i k y dk. Okay, so this is an unusual definition for the delta function, and it's an unusual integral because you can note that as k goes into infinity, this becomes a very rapidly oscillating integral both in the real and imaginary parts. But formally and in practice, we actually conduct this integral, you have your delta function.
And we'll use this result when we actually now derive the full general Fourier, inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so now in general, let us consider the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f hat of k e to the i k y. And we want to prove that this in fact gives you back your original function. And the way we do that is simply to substitute in our definition of f hat that was given here using the Fourier transform into square brackets over here, and then to rearrange or reorder our order of integration. And we can always do that, provided the function in the integrand or, or this integral converges. And we're going to assume we're working with functions for which this is true. So what we have is then if you basically put e to the i k y inside of here, and you take switch these two guys and you take f of x out, we can rewrite the integral like this. So we basically have the integral from minus infinity to infinity f of x times this thing in red dx. But please note that this thing in red dx is exactly, in some sense, the definition of the delta distribution or the integral definition of the delta distribution that we derived over here. Okay, so let's replace it. You're left with the integral from minus infinity f of x of delta of y minus x, which is just f of y. So we've effectively proven that if we apply um, or multiply our Fourier transform coefficients by e to i k y and integrate over the Fourier um, variable k, we get back our initial function that we started with. Okay, and so in general textbooks, if they define the inverse Fourier transform um, of f hat k, it's exactly this definition that we've just proven gives you back the original function. So let's now look at some of the Fourier transform properties. Okay, the first one is let the Fourier transform of k be, f hat of k be the Fourier transform of a bounded function. In other words, um, it doesn't become infinite as you go to infinity. So extreme example is a delta function or delta distribution. Um, and then we have that then the Fourier transform of g, which is defined as the derivative of x, we can then calculate, and we find, and we simply write it out as e, one over two pi. This integral, f of x e to the minus i k x, and what we do now is integrate by parts uh, and transfer this derivative onto e to the minus k i k x. We know that the boundary term vanishes because f is bounded. And what we're left with is f times the derivative of e to the minus i k x minus that, which is simply f of x times i k e to the minus i k x dx. Okay, and because the integral is over dx, you can take this i to i k term out of the integration sign, and if you do that, you simply have the definition of f hat k times i k. So in a functional derivative in the real space is very easy compute to compute in the Fourier transform space. You just simply multiply the Fourier transform through by i k. And in a similar way, you can actually work out the Fourier transform of the second derivative of f with respect to x just by applying the same procedure twice. And you have that that is just minus k squared f hat of k. Fourier transforms generalizes to two and higher dimensions as well, and it's almost a trivial generalization. What we do is we say simply define the Fourier transform of x1, a function of two variables x1, x2, um, as f hat k1, k2, where we have computed the following integral. It's a double integral, and you have your function, and for each coordinate you multiply with an e to the minus i k x term over 2 pi. Okay, sorry, this n should be 2. And just to rewrite this in a notation that actually generalizes to any dimensions, and that I'll do in the next section, is simply say, let's let x be a vector um, made up of the components x1, x2. In the real space, let k be the wave vector or the vector indicating the position in Fourier space that has coordinates k1 and k2, 
And then we can express this integral that we've given above as f hat of k is equals to 1 over 2 pi to the 2, which is correct there. The integral over, um, in some sense, the plane of f of x, um, where it is now that combination, e to the minus i k dot x, um, and then the, the sort of the area element d squared x. And similarly, you can go about then and define the inverse Fourier transform just as the function f hat times e to the i k dot x integrated over the real plane. And you can, in fact, prove that it gives you back the original function. Another useful thing that will also be that I should just write down explicitly is the Dirac delta function in two dimensions is simply the product of two one-dimensional Dirac delta functions. And so you can express the Dirac delta function in two dimensions as 1 over 2 pi squared, um, e to the i k dot x. In other words, e to the i k1 x1 plus e to the i, uh, multiplied by e to the i k2 x2. Okay, and in n dimensions, this definition we've given in terms of k and x makes it almost trivial to generalize. So let's denote the n um, uh, dimensional spatial coordinates by x being going from with variables 1 to xn and let the Fourier coordinates basically be k that goes from k1 to kn and then the Fourier transform of f of x is simply defined as the generalization of what we gave sorry over here so it's simply 1 over 2 pi n so for each coordinate you add a factor of 1 over 2 pi or multiply with a factor of 1 or 2 pi, the area over the whole um, n-dimensional sort of real space, um, multiplied by your function, multiplied by e to the minus k dot x, so x1, k1 plus x2, k2 plus, etc., xn, kn, multiplied by your um, generalized volume element. And similarly, in the generalized n-dimensional case, you have a number of properties you can write down. And the first one is the, the Fourier transform of a gradient of f. You can um, compute it in, by noting that the gradient f times e to the minus i k x is, can simply be expressed as the gradient of f, time, f times e to the i k x in brackets, subtracting the additional term minus f times the gradient of e to the minus i k dot x. And then working out what this term is explicitly is reasonably easy. You simply just apply this gradient operator to the e to the i k x. So that's simply the exponent times the gradient operator applied to k dot x. And recalling that k dot x is simply k1 x1 k2 x2 um, etc. plus kn xn, what you're left with is simply that it is k, the vector. So you have that it's equals to minus i k e to the minus i k dot x. Okay, so if you then work out the Fourier transform, what you do is basically you use this first condition and you note that this gradient um, because the domain is infinite and f is assumed to be bounded f on the boundary, it vanishes. The boundary term simply vanishes because f goes to zero. And this additional term over here is simply minus f times the gradient of e to the uh, minus i k x, which is minus i k times the exponent. So it's minus minus. So what it is becomes is, my, is ik times basically the definition of our Fourier integral of the original function f of x. Okay, and there I've written it down in blue. And this we'll be using in the next part of the lecture. Furthermore, if you want to work out the Laplace operator, and this is why we're really interested in it, the Laplace operator applied to f, you again start transferring these gradient operators onto this um, Fourier factor that we're multiplying it with. And the way you do that is to say that, fine, this Laplace operator you can get by applying the divergence to the gradient of f, 
multiplied by e to the i k x, but then you must subtract the gradient of f um, dotted in with a gradient of e to the minus i k x. And that you can actually express as the divergence of f dot um, the gradient of e to the minus i k x plus f times the Laplace operator applied to e to the minus i k x. And you can note that both these two are boundary terms that will vanish at infinity and you're only left with this one. So you've effectively transferred the operator from your function onto this Fourier factor. And you know that the Laplace operator applied to the Fourier factor is just minus ik times the Laplace operator applied to um, the Fourier factor again. Okay, so what you've used is this first result to give the first term, and then you apply it again, you, you can use the result again. So it is simply minus ik dot minus ik times e to the minus ik dot x. And what that gives you is just minus the norm squared of k times e to the minus ik dot x. Okay, so we've just shown that the Fourier transform of the Laplacian of f is simply equals to minus k squared, where k is the norm of the Fourier um, variable times the Fourier transform of f. Okay, that concludes the first part of this lecture. Please review these properties and make sure you know where they all come from and feel comfortable working with them before the next part of the lecture because we'll be using them in a quite an elegant way to try and derive the Green's function for the wave equation. It's some really nice stuff because we can do it in any dimension and then some interesting properties that come out of there. Thank you so much.